How is everyone today? <laughs> uh, I'm the instructor, Dr. Brady McCary. Uh, there was a traffic jam at the printer, so I don't have the syllabuses uh, ready for you. So I'll just briefly go over the stuff that you need, and I'll bring syllabuses or by or whatever it, the right word is uh, next time. So this is, in the first place, what, August 22nd? I have to kind of squat over a little bit. This is weird. Um, <clears throat> so I'm making a remark about the syllabus. So I'll give you a printed syllabus next time. And I'll send the link, a link for the PDF out for it today. Um, my contact information is available by email. So I think I've, I've already sent an email, right? Have I? No, I so the best way to contact me <clears throat> is by email brady.mccary at utdallas.edu so None of y'all are freshmen, so I don't really need to say this. Do you have a question? question? Uh, I was going to say you were 21, not 22. <laughs> True enough. So none of y'all are freshmen, so I don't really need to say this, but I do need to say this. And that is we all have UTD email addresses. I have one. You have one. Email's the best way for us to communicate. but. You have to send your emails to, to me from your t UTD email address to my UTD email address. That's the university policy. It, I perfectly understand that we all have Gmail addresses and Yahoo and whatever, but if you send me one from there, I'm just going to ignore it if it's not automatically deleted by my filters. Okay? Good. So that's the best way to uh, contact me. <coughs> this is the textbook that we're using. Okay, it looks like this the fifth edition. Okay, it, that should already be posted at the bookstore and everywhere else. And I'll send out uh, a link to the PDF of the syllabus that has all of this information on it. The main thing you need to know is that it's, it's the book by Hubbard and Hubbard. Okay. There's also a, um, a solutions manual which is a a, a nice companion to it if you can afford such a thing. So any question about the text? No questions about the text, yes? Um, do need to be the fifth no, not really. Uh, in, the, in the sense that I'm not going to specifically assign a question like question number whatever in chapter whatever. I won't do that. Rather, the questions will, will be provided in, in total. So in that sense, no. But you're on your own when I say section whatever, whatever. You have to figure out what that means <laughs> if you buy a different textbook. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. Um, of all the possible math books, this one is actually quite affordable in comparison to the other ones. Uh, good. So <clears throat> that's how to contact me. Uh, there's a place called the Math Lab, which he just finished uh, talking about. It's a great place. I recommend that you go there uh, if you have questions. There is a place on campus called the Testing Center. It's in the basement of the library. That's where, where we will be doing our quizzes. The Testing Center is a big room where you say, Hi, I'm so-and-so, and here's my UTD photo ID, and I'm here to take, <coughs> I'm here to take a quiz for whatever class and they say, okay, here you go, and you, you go in there and take a quiz. So if you're not familiar with the testing center, you need to become familiar with it. Okay, there's nothing really um, mysterious about it. You have to bring your UTD ID, and you're not allowed to take anything in there except for writing stuff. Okay, so don't, don't go there with some enormous thing that's precious to you, like a piano or something. Don't just, don't do it. They have lockers but 
you know, your big things won't fit in there, prop maybe. Okay. <clears throat> what else? I'm trying to remember what else, what all's on the syllabus. Uh, yeah, so during class, uh, you're not allowed to use anything that has a screen on it. Okay, so then, unless I receive written instructions from the university, and then, okay, you're allowed to use something with a screen on it. The reason is because, okay, this is a math class, and it's nice that almost all of you are math majors or some very similar major, engineering or whatever. So, so I really do have your attention, usually. That's good. Okay, but the fact of the matter is, is that if you pull up a cat video on YouTube, then you and everybody behind you is now completely enthralled by the cat video because math really can't compete with that, can it? <laughs> okay? So, so please just no screens. And if you simply must use a screen somehow to take notes or whatever, then you need to do it all the way in the back where your screen will not interfere with anyone behind you. Okay? And the same is true for noisy things. Okay? It also goes without saying that during the quizzes you're not allowed to have a communications device of any kind for obvious reasons. Any questions about any of that? Yes? The quizzes, they're not set time. It'll be an open period to go do that on our A window, time, yeah, a window of time. Okay. Monday, open of business for the testing center until Saturday, close of business for the testing center. Okay, <clears throat> good. What else is in the syllabus? Ooh, we talked about the textbook. Ah, my office, that's good. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send out the, the syllabus, so it's not too critical. So my office is Founders Annex 2.402. Now, there's three buildings on campus that have founders in their name. Okay, I'm in Founders Annex. It's the little bitty one. Okay. Uh, my office hours are not set. I'll set them probably tomorrow. Uh, so I'll, I'll wait to say anything until tomorrow about that. Um, hmm, what else? Oh, yes. So, um, in the syllabus, you'll see a link that says UTD syllabus policies. So, you've got to read that link because that goes for this class and all of the classes that you're in. And it includes things like what constitutes academic dishonesty, which is a euphemism for cheating. So, the long story is, is that if it's not your work, then you cheated. And I'll just tell you honestly, I'll probably catch you. And I'd really rather that not occur, mainly for selfish reasons, because it takes a lot of work for me to do all the paperwork. So from a purely selfish point of view, my point of view, <laughs> please don't cheat. Okay? Also, it won't be good for you. Okay? So please don't do it. Uh, other important things in the, in the syllabus policies includes things like, are you aware that it is now the law in the state of Texas that people can carry firearms on campus. Wow, that's, that might be news to some of you. At any rate, all of that kind of stuff is, in, is at that link, and you should look at it and be familiar with it. Uh, one important thing is that there is an office on campus called the Office of Student Accessibility. If you've never heard of it, then, you don't, then it, it, I'm almost surely not talking to you. Okay? OSA is the group that says, okay, this student um, has our permission to take the quiz for example, in a quiet environment or whatever. So OSA are the, are the folks who tell instructors that this student is to receive an accommodation like that. So if I don't, the only person okay, who can give me your OSA uh, form is you. If you don't give it to me, no one's going to give it to me and I won't know about it. And none of your testing conditions or lecturing conditions will be any different and you won't have any recourse to say, like, you get halfway through the semester and say, oh, I'm supposed to be able to take quizzes in a quiet environment. Okay, from now on you can, but all the ones that you already did, they're gone. Okay, so, long story short, if you have an OSA form, bring it to me as soon as possible, and we'll take care of that. And by as soon as possible, I mean the soonest possible moment is when lecture's over. Okay, any questions about any of that? Okay, uh, this is multivariable calculus, so you have to have the expectation as for your work, as for what you submit, uh, it's the work that's being graded, right? If you don't, if you're, <laughs> if you get to the correct answer, right, 
I hope none of us think, think that anymore at this level. But if you get to the correct answer, but you don't use the correct method, you're not going to receive any credit for your, for your efforts. Okay? It's, it's the work that gets you credit. Of course, that sword cut, cuts both ways, because if your work is, is, is by and large correct, but you make some very marginal arithmetic error, like you say that 3 times 5 is 8, because you were in a hurry. And it's kind of like 8, because 3 plus 5 would be 8. Okay, if you make a, a marginal error like that, then you'll get most of the credit for the exercise. Okay, so it cuts both ways, the partial credit thing. Uh, good. <coughs> so I can't say what's, what sections are going to be covered when, because that's all in the syllabus. I don't have that memorized. Uh, but I can say the way all of the grading is structured. Okay. So the grading is, uh, the whole grade system is structured on weeks. So we've got some week here. So here's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then another week, Sunday, <coughs> Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then one more week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Okay, so this class meets three days a week. What days? Tuesday, Thursday are the lectures, and then Friday is the lab, the problem section. Okay. So what's going to happen is, is every Tuesday, every Tuesday, I'm going to produce some homework exercises for you. We'll refer to these as written homework. You will turn them in at the subsequent lecture. So we're, we'll do some, we'll eventually get to some math stuff today. And then written homeworks will be assigned. You'll turn them in at the beginning of lecture next Tuesday, the Tuesday that's seven days from now. Okay? We'll do the same thing for Thursdays. Is that the Thursday material, some written homework will be created, and you'll turn it in the subsequent Tuesday, or the subsequent Thursday. Okay? Then, <clears throat> These are turned in, and then on this Friday, this Friday is a problem section right there. So that's, uh, I haven't decided what we're going to do Friday that's three days from now. So we might have a problem section, we might not. I'll send an announcement. But definitely in three plus seven days, there's a problem section. And the problem section will cover the material from those days. So problem section will be graded on uh, attendance and participation. You'll go there and there'll be a, a, a list of problems that you're expected to work on and you'll break into groups and you'll all discuss and otherwise follow the TA's instructions and the TA will assess whether or not you're attending and participating. Okay? Any question about uh, the way that will go? Then, over this material. which includes this material, you will have a quiz in the next next week. And it must be taken in here. So the way the course is, is, is it all, all topics span three weeks. So this is a, a week where we're lecturing over new things. Okay? This is a week where you're turning in homework and, and otherwise doing a bunch of exercises over those things. And then this week is when you're taking a quiz at the testing center over those things. So by the time you get to like the fourth week or something like that, that means that all three things are, occur are occurring simultaneously. 
We're talking about new things. You're turning in homeworks over the previous week. And you're taking a quiz over the previous, previous week. Okay, so it's a bunch of stuff all, all happening at the same time. So any question about this, the way this goes? Yes? Um, so just to say, are you saying we have a quiz every three weeks or a quiz every week? Every week. Every week, okay. Every week starting next week, except the quiz next week is not a quiz because we didn't have a thing last week. Next week is going to be, can you make it successfully to the testing center <laughs> and produce your ID and not bring a piano? Okay. <laughs> no piano. <laughs> Just as, if it fits in the locker, it fits in the locker. <laughs> yes? Um, this is my first semester at UGD, but I've heard by rumor that uh, no calculators whatsoever are allowed. Is this the case? In no calculator is going to be allowed. This is a, this is a calculus course. <laughs> yeah, no, there's no, no, it wouldn't help you. To, to be, <laughs> just, to, just to be flatly honest, it, would, it wouldn't help you. Well, I mean, you can do you can do a lot of scalar calculus with a, with a calculator these days, but it's just not going to help you on the material that we're doing. It just won't. Okay, so we have uh, for assignments for for graded stuff so far. There's been uh, what three things talked about. So we've got the quizzes. Okay, quizzes are sixty percent of your grade. Wow. Okay. <laughs> the written homework, written homework is 10% of your grade. <clears throat> That's 70. Yeah. And then participation, attendance and participation at the problem section is 10% of your grade. So how much is left? 20%. So here's the other 20%. Okay, the other 20% is oral exams. I don't mean I'm going to do any dentistry. Okay, not like that. What I mean, <laughs> darn. <laughs> what I mean is that each of you will come to my office and you're going to have to prove something to me on my whiteboard. Okay? And it's, and I'm, if you, you know, I won't, I'm not, it's not supposed to be terrifying, though it will be. <laughs> it's not supposed to be that way. You can bring a friend, okay, but your friend must remain quiet. <laughs> okay? You'll have oral exams where you must prove things. These constitute the other 20% of your grade. For those of you that are math majors, this, you should be very happy about this because in the end, this is what you must do. You must learn how to argue mathematical points. For those of you who are not math majors, this will just be a strong confirmation that you don't want to be a math major. <laughs> but that, that I expect everyone to get full, full credit on the oral exam. Okay, yes? Oh, how come are those, the oral exams? Uh, we're going to have three of three. Yeah, we're going to have three of them. Uh, and I, they're going to be rolling because we, I, I can't do every one of you in a day, not even close. So what, what I'll have you do is, is, is schedule them. And as far as I'm concerned, you can do them very early. Okay. So you will have to prove uh, what? You'll have to prove Fermat's theorem. That will be one exam. You will have to prove Rolle's theorem and its immediate corollary, the mean value theorem and you will have to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, and you'll have to give me uh, definitions that correspond to, 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 making these thing, to making these things make sense. Okay, so that's 100% of your grade. Very good, yes? So, we, we're, we're definitely going to have a final exam and we're probably going to have a midterm exam. So we definitely have a midterm exam uh, because the registrar set a, mid a time, sorry, we're definitely going to have a final exam because the registrar set one. I asked them to set a midterm exam, but I just looked a couple hours ago and they haven't set one. 
So I'm going to ask for one, and if they said it, we're going to have it. Okay, at any rate, this is how the exam will go. By the time, suppose we do have a midterm exam. Okay, it'll be in the middle. For one thing. Okay, by the time we take that exam, we will have taken something like six quizzes. Okay, each quiz has three exercises on it, which means you will have taken at that time 18 quiz exercises. What the midterm, and, and each one of those quiz exercises will be individually recorded in the grade book. That is to say, you will have a grade for quiz three, question one, quiz three, question two, quiz three, question three. They'll be all individually in there, not, not summary, not, not summed up. Okay, so you will have taken, supposing we have a midterm, we, you will have taken 18 exercises by that time, and you will have done maybe good and maybe not so good on some of them. At that time, you'll be given an opportunity to redo makeup version, make up uh, versions of each of those exercises, and you'll be able to do up to like, I haven't decided yet, probably like six if we have a midterm. Uh, if there's no midterm, then, then the, the basket's going to just be totally full at the, at, for the final exam. At that point, you will have taken on the order of 40 quiz questions, and you'll be given an opportunity to redo like 15 of them or something like that. Yes? It's not a grade, it's just for makeup, like for making a quiz grade. Right. So if we do really well on the quiz, we could literally just opt out of the midterm. In principle, yeah. In principle. I yes? Agree. Is uh, that for full credit or partial? Full credit. Because my teaching philosophy is I don't really care if you didn't understand it in the third week. All that I really need is for you to understand it by the time you leave. <laughs> That's all that I really need. Yes? We happen to do where someone hurt us. It, well, I'll think about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think about that because that's a little concerning. <laughs> uh, so, if we redo it, um, will it just replace the lowest grade or will it replace the corresponding grade? Like what the, the corresponding grade. Oh, okay. So, if you just happen to pick 15 that we did well on, then we just have a No, 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 you're not understanding. <laughs> when, when you come to the exam, Okay, there will be each, if, if there's, if you have taken 36 quiz questions, there'll be 36 stacks of paper, and this one will be called quiz three, question two. You take that one. Okay, you, you, you would take you, yours, and they would take theirs. Everybody would take probably a different subset. And yes? so we will have the previously worked problem in the quizzes on the exam. I don't understand your question. Um, so the quiz three, question three, will we have what we, our partial credit or our attempt on the quiz for the exam? Or is it, given the problem again, we rework it? It's gonna be a completely new problem. Good, okay, so it's not, it's okay. Yeah, I reserve the right to, to, to change the question in any reasonable way, such that a reasonable instructor would say, yeah, these two questions are comparable. Okay. Yes? So we should know when we arrive, like, yeah, you're going to have to know that, right? <laughs> Before you get to the exam, right? All, it's all going to be in the grade book. And you should, you'll just have to look and say, oh, it would just do an optimization problem. It would be in my best interest <laughs> if I were to improve these ones. Yeah. Yes? Regarding the quizzes we are taking in the Center, are they on paper or are they on time? On what? Yeah. You know, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can't have a calculus class without paper. No, we won't be doing we won't be doing any multiple guess questions or anything like that. Is the piano allowed on the midterm? <laughs> please, please don't, because there's not there wouldn't be enough room if everybody brought their piano. Other questions. So, no questions? No more? Okay. So, the last bit is that, uh, so, when, when lecture's going, I write the lectures on these, these pieces of paper, and then after the lecture is over, I scan them and post them on the internet, so, so that's nice. I'm also recording this, um, and it will be posted to YouTube, so that also is nice. Uh, however, don't take that as license to not attend, because from the census day forward, I'll be taking attendance, and your attendance and participation 
is part of is part of this grade. Okay, so you have to come here. Okay, good. Any questions before we get to math? Yes. Why, why is that? Oh, it's, it shouldn't be, in fact. That, <laughs> it shouldn't be. It should be, it should be this. Blah. Like that. So what I'm saying is that we go over stuff on Tuesday and Thursday, and potentially the TA teaches you some more things on Friday or makes some things clear for you. Uh, and then that is the quiz. Yes? I haven't decided if we're having a, a, a thing this Friday. <coughs> Other questions? But I'll send, a, I'll send a message tomorrow. Okay. <coughs> okay. It'll be something that's posted online. Okay. You print it and bring it in. Good. Yes? Just to say, printing stops for me, just work the problems out on the notebook paper and put that in instead, or do you need to have it printed out? It must be printed. Okay. It must be printed because uh, the pages are specially formatted so that they can be scanned. Oh, okay. So if you trust yourself enough <laughs> to, to copy it, <laughs> even with a barcode, then I guess you could try that. But probably printing it. Yes? During your uh, work assignments early, if you have like finished both the Tuesday and Thursday assignments, you never know they don't do that? No, because you're going to be here anyway, right? right. <laughs> you got to be, they, they need to be turned in when they're due because there's, there's two reasons for this. One, one reason is, is that we're going to be exchanging literally thousands of pages. Okay, so then I can't have y'all, even if a small percentage of y'all were to insist, oh, I want to turn it in a little bit early, you'd be, you might be surprised just how many thousands of special cases that causes for me. So it's a big problem for me. The second reason is that I want you to show up every Tuesday and every Thursday and the homework is part of the prod to make that happen. Yes? Yes, that's the back of the question about late work, uh, not accepted? What's not accepted. Question? Not accepted. If, if, you, if you have a, a, a legitimate excuse to miss, then I'll excuse you from the assignment. Okay, but I won't accept any late papers. Because as soon as the papers are turned in, I'm going to post a key to them, both a, a video and a PDF. So I'm not going to accept anything late because I don't want to grade my own work. Other questions? Okay. Finally get to the, to the math. Good. Okay, so the purpose of today, one of the purposes of today, is to explain why this course exists in the first place, because it helps to understand why, why should this course exist. So one of the, one of the points of view of why this course exists is that when you're doing calculus one, what is typically called calculus one, it is the study of functions f which have signature reals to reals. Both from the differential point of view and the integral point of view. Okay, so that, that's calculus one. Calculus two, <coughs> what is typically called calculus two, is the study of two different kinds of functions. It's the study of functions that have signature reals to Rn, for some n, usually two or three, but in principle, the st most of the stuff that you've learned in calculus two works for any dimension. You learn some, some specific important things when uh, the domain 
uh, sorry, when the range is three, do you get to learn things like uh, the T and B frame, the unit tangent, the unit normal, and the unit binormal, and all of that. Okay, the, when n is three, these are things like space curves, the trajectory that uh, a rocket goes through space. <coughs> In Calculus 2, you also study functions that have the signature uh, Rm to R. So these are, and in Calculus 2, usually the domain is R2. So that is to say, you look at functions of two variables, x and y. That's, that's primarily what you're doing in Calculus 2. But what I'd like to point out to you is that in Calculus 1, the domain and the range of the signature are scalars. In Calculus 2, at least one of them is scalar. At least one of them is scalar. So anytime either one of them is scalar, it makes things really nice and easy. It makes it, makes it to where a lot of simplifications occur. You can ignore a lot of details. So. The kind of functions that we're studying in multivariable calculus in this one, which in some instances is called calculus three, what do you think, what do you think we're doing in this class? RM. Yeah. We're doing functions from Rm to Rn. <coughs> where neither domain nor range uh, is scalar. Okay, now this this uh, opens up a big, beautiful mess that we have to uh, make our way through. Okay, so that, that's a big part of it. Now, we want to study, in order to, to do this, remember, the calculus point of view, the, the differential point of view in calculus is that everything is flat. Okay, we like to think that everything is flat. You zoom in close enough to something, it's flat. That's what tangency is. Okay, if you have a curve that's differentiable at a point, if you zoom in on it close enough, if you were a little creature, let's just draw it. So there's a nice smooth function. <coughs> And then we can select a particular input, like this input, C. And then that's the output. And if this is the function y is f of x, then what's our name for the output? F of C? <coughs> so now, is the red thing flat? It's not flat, right? It's not. But uh, if, you, if you were a little bitty creature right there at that point, okay, and you just zoomed in really, really close, then the whole world to you would be perfectly well approximated by that graphite thing. Okay, that's the tangent line. Okay. Similarly, we are actually little bitty creatures on an enormous thing to us. Okay. And if you were out, say, in the middle of Kansas, which is an exceptionally flat state north of here, then what does the world look like to us? It looks flat. It isn't, but it may as well be for the next several uh, thousand feet in any direction it may as well be it's flat enough in comparison to our size so um, <clears throat> you want to be able to study flat things okay and the the mathematicians word for flat things is linear so you want to know the linear maps that go from RM to RN and what course is that the study of the linear maps from RM to RN linear algebra, linear algebra. So that's why you had to take linear algebra before you got here, because, because, yeah, because you have to be able to do matrices. 
You've got to know about it because in, in the end, the derivative of functions from Rm to Rn, the derivative is a matrix. Because a matrix is the, rep is the numerical representation of a linear map from Rm to Rn. So you've got to be able to deal with matrices before you get here. Okay, so is everybody okay with, with that particular spiel? You've got, to, you've got to have linear algebra because in the end, the derivative is linear algebra. Yes? Um, this is just out of curiosity. You keep writing REM in the corner. What does that signify? Remark. Remark. Okay. I have a lot of uh, idiosyncrasies, so they'll come up. Other questions? Okay, another point of view is that um, in scalar calculus, that is the calculus where both sides are scalars, domain and range, we have this beautiful result, the fundamental theorem of calculus. And there's nothing, in calculus too, there's nothing like it at all. So what I'm going to do for the rest of today, if I have enough time, is I'm going to try and impress, and it might bleed into the next lecture. I'm going to try to impress upon you just how incredible the fundamental theorem of calculus is. Okay, it's an incredible thing. And I want, w once I hopefully have you smitten with how incredible it is, I want to point out to you that there's nothing like it at all in calculus too. Nothing like it. Okay, there's some neat things, like Fubini's theorem is pretty terrific in calculus too, but we have nothing like it in, uh, nothing like the fundamental theorem in, in calculus two. So in calculus three is where we finally get something. We finally get something in it and hopefully it all starts to make a lot of sense. Okay, and that something is what we're aiming for at the, in the closing weeks of the semester. Does anyone know the name of that something? That's, that's part of it, what, the, but I'm, that's a special case of something else. Stokes theorem, Stokes, yeah. So. Green's theorem and the divergence theorem and the fundamental theorem of calculus and all these things are all special cases of something called Stokes' theorem. Okay, so Stokes' theorem is, it's not too much to say, the most incredible theorem in all of calculus, really. Uh, unless you get really far and abstract, Th then there's some more incredible things. So we're, we're heading towards Stokes' theorem. So now, in order to put what Stokes' theorem is into context, uh, I'm going to build up all of the uh, oral exam proofs that you're going to have to do. So they're going to be on paper and recorded on video. So you'll be able to do them, no problem. Okay. So we're going to build up to the, the fundamental theorem of calculus. So in the first place, let's remember some definitions. So, uh, definition. Definition of a minimum. <clears throat> so, let uh, F be defined on some set A to the reals, where A is a subset of the reals. So we're still talking about scalar calculus, right? Because we're building up to the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay. <clears throat> the point x, uh, 0, we'll say c, since I used c on the previous page. The point c <coughs> in A is called the minimum of f when, when what? <laughs> right, f of c is less or equal to f of x for all x in a. So do we know this quantifier? So, okay, so, so uh, let's make a remark then. Remark. This quantifier, uh, upside down, A looking thing, this means uh, for all.
And the one that always goes with it is this one. What does this one mean? There exists. There exists. And how about this one? What does that one mean? Is an element of or in. So we have to have these things, otherwise, otherwise the discussion is too clumsy. We have to be able to say these kinds of things. So just, just to remind you then, uh, the def t to use these in a sentence, <laughs> since we are having new words, the definition of limit is that the statement, the limit as x goes to c of f of x equal to L. So this, this statement is a very compact way to write the following sentence. This means, who can say it for us? Can anyone? For all epsilon greater than zero, there is a delta greater than zero, such that such that 0 less than x minus c less than delta. So when the, the truth of this statement implies what? Very, very good. OK, so this is a, that's a math sentence. OK, and it's, this is its, a, a short way to say it. Okay, so this is the definition of limit. We've all got to be familiar with it because we're math majors. But now that, now that you are perhaps learning the, these quantifiers for the first time, I'd like for you to note that in this definition and in other theorems and things like that, every time that you see this symbol, this quantifier, you also see that quantifier. They always come together, which is the source of the following joke, which can be made at any math conference even if you're in a foreign land and don't speak the language. Every mathematician will know what you mean. <laughs> it's a, it's, a, it's a, a theorem about math theorems. <laughs> Got one. So for every, for every, there is or there is. <laughs> for every one of these, there is one of those. <laughs> See? Yeah? Okay. Well, it's a pretty good joke <coughs> as far as abstract mathematics is concerned. Okay, so we were talking about the minimum. So this is the minimum. To be a minimum of a function means that for all of the other x's that are in the domain, this one is less or equal to all of them. So in particular, do understand that a line that uh, a horizontal line segment, what points are minimal? All of them are minimal. Okay, an analogous thing that I won't even take the time to write because I wrote this one is maximum. How is maximum more or less just like this? Right, that one would be reversed. Okay, notably also, if you have a horizontal line, which points are maximal? All of them. Okay, so then that's a nice corner case in the definition that for a horizontal line, all points are both uh, maximal and minimal. Okay, good. Any question about that? Okay. <clears throat> so here's a, a very s serious theorem that we're not going to prove in this class, but that you do already know. It is called the extreme value theorem. Theorem. <clears throat> It always makes me think like it's trying to sell something. Right? The extreme value theorem. I don't know. So can anyone tell us what it is? It's not that one. This, this, this theorem knows nothing about um, derivatives. If you have a continuous function on a closed interval, 
it's you 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 left out one thing, but what is it? What must be bounded? Okay, not quite. It's something else. The interval must be bounded, right? So it's that the function has to be defined on a closed and bounded interval. It's not enough for it to be closed. It's not enough for it to be closed. It's not enough for the interval, interval to be bounded. You must have both. OK, so let f be defined uh, f. I'll write it like this. f from a to b, like so to the reals be continuous. So what I, I, something is going unsaid and I don't, I don't want anything to go unsaid so I'm going to say it. This is closed and bounded. Now we're not really going to get into these matters, topological matters in this class, because this is, after all, a 2,000 level class. But does anyone know the name of the generalization of things that are closed and bounded? Not that one. Compact. OK? So then for those of you who are math majors, or otherwise are going to go on and take some more, you should know for future reference that this situation is referred to as compact. when you're in the reals. Closed and bounded might not mean compact if you find yourself somewhere else. So let f uh, be defined from a closed and bounded interval to the reals and let f be continuous. What's the conclusion? Right. Then, there exists a little m and a big M in the interval a to b. There's a little m and there's a big M. And what's going to be true about the little m? It's the min. It's the min, right? Such that m is the minimum min minimum. Too many use. The minimum of F and M is the maximum of F. So what this is saying is that if you have a continuous, if you take a closed and bounded interval and you you make it transform under a continuous function so it becomes something else. That means that uh, in the end, you're going, to have, you're going to be able to find the place in the inputs where the mi not only does the minimum exist, but you can find the place where it, it existed in the input and similar for the maximum. But what this, what this theorem does not say, it doesn't say anything about where it might be. It doesn't say anything about it. It just, it just promises that it exists. So. Lots of, lots of math theorems are existence theorems like this. This is an existence theorem. It doesn't say how to find it or how to make it uh, or, or where even you might look for it. It just guarantees that it exists. That's all that it is. Yes? That's just at least one. It, you're right. You're right. Because, for example, we could have a closed and bounded interval, say the unit interval, and we could have a constant function, horizontal. And then in that case, every single point is the minimum, and every single point is the maximum. Okay. So let's try and look at and see why, why, um, why is closed alone not enough? Why is closed alone not enough? So we can't prove this, it, because we don't have the tools to do it in this class. But let's make some remarks about the theorem. Why do we need closed? All the, can someone produce a counterexample? That is to say, I want a function that's continuous, but defined on a, defined on a domain that's not closed. 
and, and it violates the existence. So what I mean, let, what I mean, this is what I'm asking for. I'm asking for an interval, interval, or, or any set. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll make, to make it simple, I'll make it an interval. An interval which is bounded, but not closed. And I want a function that is continuous. So I want an interval that's not that's not closed, I but but it is bounded, and I want a function that is that is continuous, and I want you to pr produce for me a function that has no min or max. Yeah. Zero to one open. Okay. So how about let's take f from zero to one open to the reals, and we'll do it by the identity function, as you say, f of x is x. So let's take a look at it. If you were to plot it, what would it look like? It, it, well, all lines are straight. It'd be, a, it'd be the diagonal line at, at, at 45 degrees. <laughs> I'm making you nervous, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, and then by the, by the open convention thingy, that means that those, those points are not present. Okay, now, have a look at this. Does it have a maximum? Not really. It does not. It's not not really. It's either yes or no, right? So why can't it just be the, like, immediately right before the end point, that point right there would be the highest? Yeah. Let's look at it. Yeah. Let's, okay, why can't you have that? let's look at it. So the yeah. interval, no, the interval 0 to 1 is right here. Okay, so let's draw it like this. So 0 to 1, like this. These are all the inputs. And those are all the outputs up there. <clears throat> now I want you to imagine, you might say, well, maybe we can just get right here. If this is really close. Okay, so can you even see that on the thing? Yeah. So is that the lowest value? No, it isn't, because that would correspond, for a variety of reasons, here's one way to say it, is that that would correspond to this point. Right? Can, you, can you move this point any further to the left? Yeah, you could take half the distance between zero and that point. So if that happened to be epsilon, then you could go to epsilon over two, and that would be even lower. So for that reason, so this one's even lower right there. For that reason, there can be no minimum. There isn't one. Similar reasons, there's no maximum. Okay, so, so close, if, if you relax the closed condition, it, it, it's broken. It won't be true. Okay, why do we need it to be bounded? By, by the way, by the way, I've been saying not closed. Does that mean open? No, it doesn't. <laughs> Right, so in, in, that's another thing you math majors will have to come to grips with, is that sets are not doors. That's the joke among topologists. <laughs> sets are not doors. Doors are either open or closed, right? But that's not true about sets. It, unless you're studying really abstract topology called door spaces, in which that really is true. <laughs> that every set is either open or closed. Okay, <clears throat> so why bounded? That is to say, I want you to relax just that one condition. I want you to give me an interval which is closed but not bounded, uh, and I want you to give me a function which is continuous, and I want you to uh, show me that there's either not a minimum or not a maximum or neither. So now. We need, we need, we need one that's closed but not bounded. Continuous. Right, we need, the we need the interval to be closed but not bounded. So now this is... So like it couldn't be like 10. Like zero to one. 
but like, it, I, I, what is what is a bounded? Sorry. What is a bounded interval? An, an interval that has a finite length. Okay. So like, it could be it could be really long, like zero to ten. But that still has finite length. So, so here, here's the here's the thing that yeah. So we say it's like closed between two functions, so closed between like x, like x squared and x to the third. Would that be closed but not bounded? So it's closed in between that region, but not not a solid numerical bound. So we're we're not saying the same thing. I think there's some a bit of confusion. What what has to be closed and bounded? An interval. The interval. The interval. So we're not even talking about the function yet. So, so that, that's not even come up yet. So right now I need someone to give us an interval which is closed but not bounded. Okay. So like this, so f from 0 to infinity like so. <laughs> no, no, no. Now I see what the problem is. Is this, is this a closed interval? No. Opposite of no? Yes? This is closed. It is closed. How do you know if something's closed? What, what does closed mean? Ah, now I understand the problem. What does closed mean? It doesn't mean that it has two endpoints. That's not what it means. It means it's the complement of an open set. That's what it means. What is the complement? What is the complement of zero to infinity? So how do y'all write complement with a superscript C? is negative infinity to zero, and is zero included or not? not? It is not. Is this set open? Yes. Therefore, that set is closed, because it's the complement of an open set. OK. So, so let's write that down. Closed set is the complement of an open set. So one thing that's, that's interesting, one thing that's interesting is how about all the reals? Or all the real, like that is to say negative infinity to infinity. Is that open? Yes. Yes? What's the complement of the reals? The, the empty set. So that means that the empty set is open. The empty set is open. Also, also, the empty set is closed. <laughs> the empty set is also closed. And so that means that the empty set is clopen. Yeah. Clopen. <laughs> Both. Yeah, that's a word. Is that the technical term? Clopen. It is. Uh, yeah. It is. Yeah. The, the reals themselves and the empty set are, are the only clopen subsets of the reals. That's important, but not for our class. So if one set's clopen, its complement will also be clopen. That's right. Exactly. OK. Oh, but we didn't say why this wouldn't work. So let's consider this. If we were to draw this, what would it look like? Right. We'd have this, this point would be there. That one would be there at the origin there. And then it would go all the way up like parabolas do. So it has a minimum. Why does that? So the minimum exists, but why is the theorem violated? Right, because the maximum doesn't exist, right? The theorem is, is violated because both must exist, right? And if you wanted one that did it the other way, then this one does it the other way, right? That one has a maximum, but no minimum. Yes? It seems, though, that it's only, like, open on one end. It's only closed on one end. So really, the open end is the one that where we can't have a maximum. But that seems like we would just say it's, because we do, the side where it is closed, we do have a minimum, and it's just the open end. That doesn't seem like that is any different than what we did before. So what, so what I'm doing, so what I, I'm speculating about what's happening in your head there. There's, there's 
there's two different concepts. There's two different concepts. There's the concept of something being closed, and there's the concept of something being bounded. Now, until you got to this class, almost all the time that something was closed, it was also bounded. So what I think is that for, for you in particular, and maybe most of you, those two concepts are the same. What I'm telling you is that they're separate, and we're separating them now. Yes? I think that what I was trying to say was it has a lower bound. But yeah. The end where it doesn't have an upper bound, then we, have, we can have a maximum because it has an upper bound. But yeah, but like, it's maximum 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 maximum. Maximum. You've got to have both. Oh. Got to have both. Okay, so then we, we relaxed the closed, we relaxed the bounded. So now let's take, it, take something that's closed and bounded but not continuous, and therefore it doesn't have uh, a, a max or a min, either one. So now let's relax continuous. Why continuous? So uh, I'll start it out by saying, well, we're going to talk about a function on this closed and bounded interval, the unit interval, the one that everyone loves. Now, can someone give me um, a function that is not bounded or, or even doesn't have a maximum? Yeah. 1 over x. Well, it's not defined everywhere, right? So we could, we could define it by f of x is 1 over x except for when that's not allowed. <coughs> but now you need to complete the definition. And x equals zero for so what, so x is x, but x equals zero? Okay, I'll, I'll just write zero, <laughs> like this. So what would this look like if we did this? So just, just there, right? That would mean that, yeah, this function would be, this, would be the hyperbola. So it does this kind of thing and then comes to here and hits that point, that goes up, and then it's defined right there. So is that function defined everywhere on the interval? It is. Does it have a minimum? It does. Does it have a maximum? It does not. And if you wanted it to be the other way, you could do it like that. Okay? So is it clear that every, every little bit of that theorem is necessary. If you relax even a little bit, it, the, the, the theorem just slips away. Okay. So those of you that are math majors, you're going to have to end up proving that one. Not today. Not this, not this course. But before you're done. Okay. So that's the extreme value theorem. <clears throat> now, we have the definition of derivative. But we all just, I'm just going to write it down because we all know it. And remember, we're still talking about scalar calculus. We're not even talking about the calculus of functions from Rm to Rn yet. So let <coughs> f uh, from a to r be defined on an open neighborhood do we know that open neighborhood? Okay. <laughs> On an open neighborhood of C. Uh, so that means an open neighborhood is an open uh, set containing C. So let f be defined uh, on an open neighborhood, on an open set containing C. Uh, then the derivative of f evaluated at C is defined as the limit as x goes to C of f of x minus f of C over x minus C. Okay, so that's the definition of derivative. It is sometimes written in a slightly different way where you call 
h uh, is equal to what? How do I want to make it right? Uh, it's going to have to be x minus c. Did I do it in the right order, though? If I do x minus c, yeah, that'll work. x minus c. If h is x minus c, then notice that x is h plus c, or c plus h. And in that case, the definition of derivative looks like the limit as h goes to 0 of f of c plus h minus f of c over h. So now, these are logically equivalent. For the purposes of computation, this is the one that's typically used. But for the purposes of understanding, especially theorems, this is the one that's typically used. Okay, so this is the one we're going to use more than this one in, in our class. Yeah, C plus A, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So this one's good for computing, this one's good for understanding. Okay, so we have derivative. <clears throat> Definition. of a critical point. Now what is a critical point? There's two varieties. Where x prime is undefined or zero. Right. So a critical point is uh, given a differentiable function, so or given a function. F, a critical point of F is a point where there is no tangent so there's no tangent whatsoever or what's the other condition? The tangent is horizontal. So that is to say, there is a tangent, and also that tangent is horizontal. Of course, these conditions correspond to, in the scalar calculus c case, that the derivative at C is undefined or does not exist. That, that is to say, the limit doesn't exist when you attempt to compute it. And what is the analytic case for this one? When the derivative does exist and is in fact equal to zero. Okay, so we're, to, we're going to give these names so that we can refer to them by name. So this one is going to be called a stationary point. The kind where the, the tangent does exist and is horizontal. And then this kind is going to be called the non-smooth kind. Why do I say non-smooth? Yeah, so what's, what's the go-to example for a function that lacks a tangent at a particular point? Absolute value. Absolute value, right? It's pointy at the origin. Okay, so it's not smooth there. If you were to it's very sharp. If you were to rub on it, it, you'd cut yourself. It's terrible. Okay? So the last thing I want to say is the first thing we're going to prove next time. It is for Ma's theorem. <clears throat> what is for Ma's theorem? Mm -hmm. but, but, but it's backwards, is that every local uh, extremum, that's to say min or max, occurs at a critical point.
So that is to say that if you have a function and it has a local extremum, then it must be the case <coughs> that the derivative either doesn't exist there or the derivative is zero there. Is the converse true? That is to say, if you find a place where the derivative is, is undefined or zero, does that mean you've necessarily found an extremum? No. It does not. The converse of Fermat's is not true, but Fermat's is true, and we'll prove it next time. So see you on Thursday. Questions?